Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 147. We're closing in on the end of the book of Psalms. A um, few more weeks. Psalm 147. And let's read the first nine verses. Praise you the Lord, for it is good. Sing praises unto our God. Excuse me. Let me start all over again. Praise you the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God. For it is pleasant, and praise is comely. Comely means it's becoming of a Christian. It's fitting. It's proper for a Christian to give praise to God. Amen. Amen. There you go. For the, the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifted up the meek and casteth the wicked down to the ground. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God, who covereth the heaven with clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. If you notice verses 1, 2, and 3, they're clearly millennial in their application. God's emphasis is not on the church or the church age. His emphasis is not on church membership uh, or even the plan of salvation in this psalm. But rather, his emphasis, uh, rather, he emphasizes one theme, one constant theme. We've seen this throughout the book of Psalms. And it's the theme of every politician since the book of Genesis until this very day. That is a perfect government. Or who's going to ultimately run whom? And um, every war, every governmental enterprise over history, ultimately, um, has been somehow tied directly to man's effort to bring in a peaceful form of world government without Jesus Christ. This is what politicians endeavor to do. They think that by themselves, uh, through their own efforts, they can bring about a perfect government. Now, we have to... Uh, say and just pause long enough to admit that the United States founding while it was not founded directly on the New Testament of the Bible it nevertheless gave God his proper due at least the founders uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, when they were gathered in the uh, Continental Congress in Philadelphia they were thrashing out the language that which should be in the Constitution. He said to the men, How is it, sirs, that we have not yet thought once about employing the God of heaven, without whose help this uh, enterprise of ours shall undoubtedly fail? Mm -hmm. And so they began to, they, they had a prayer meeting, they went to talk to God as uh, they could, asking for his divine guidance in the shaping and the formation of this new government. But um, God is patient, and he'll let men continue to go to war with one another and kill each other until he decides to send in the Lord Jesus Christ, who will kill another uh, great multitude of men at his second coming and his advent. Look ahead at verses 12, 13, and 14. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. For he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates. He hath blessed thy children within thee. He maketh peace in thy borders and filleth thee with the finest of the wheat. Um, those verses haven't been fulfilled yet. The modern state of Israel has prospered. That's uh, a without dispute. But it is not safe and secure at this moment. And the, the, the proof is the full-time effort it takes for the government of Israel and the military of Israel to try and protect the people of Israel. Whether it's the Iron Dome or mm -hmm. 
or the um, security walls that they've erected around some of their cities uh, and the checkpoints uh, to enter or to exit um, and checking under each car and checking uh, the personal belongings of every driver to make sure there's no hidden bomb or explosives coming into those cities. It's only through those kinds of efforts that have that, that help to minimize the destruction and the terrorism and the suicide bombers of Muslims. So the safety and security that is provided by uh, the God of Israel is not theirs at this present time. That'll all have to come to pass in the future. And in this text, we find 12 more reasons, just as we did in the last psalm, 12 more reasons for praising God in these first nine verses. And I'll run through a list of those for you. First of all, he builds up Jerusalem. That's literal in the millennium, verse 2. Uh, he will restore Jerusalem to its full glory and splendor. Uh, unlike any other city in the world, that will be the capital of planet Earth, the city of Jerusalem. And uh, do you know, if you've ever seen a map that, that supposedly shows the, the geographic center of the world, where they take all of the land mass, north, south, east, and west, and they, and they try to pinpoint one spot right in the dead center of all the land mass and say that that spot is the geographic center of the world, uh, all the maps seem to pinpoint the location where the pyramids are located in Gaza, or uh, not Gaza, but, but in uh, the pyramid of Giza, Egypt, excuse me. And yet, for the longest time, I've doubted that. I've doubted that. I think the geographic center of this world is in Jerusalem. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And most, more specifically, Mount Calvary. Yep. Amen. More specifically, Mount Calvary. And uh, the place, the, the hill of Golgotha, one of the mountains of uh, Israel, is more than likely the same place where Abraham sought to offer Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. And um, that's another subject for another uh, study. But it's always seemed to me that if that's where the capital of the world will be when Jesus Christ returns, then that must be the geographic center of all the landmass in the world. And of course, if you believe in modern, the modern scientific theories of uh, global warming or, or uh, climate change, they can't even call it global warming because there's no demonstrable proof of that. So they say climate change. That can mean anything. Every time the seasons change, every four times every year, we have climate change. Right, right now it's called springtime. We'll have climate change again in a couple months called summer. But um, anyway... He builds up Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be the capital of planet Earth under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. The walls surrounding the cities, uh, protecting the cities, will then be able to come down. There will be no need of an iron dome or any sort of military defense. The armies of the world will be rendered uh, uh, null and void because the Lord Jesus Christ will be ruling with a rod of iron. And the, the military defense of the worlds will be completely unnecessary at that time. Secondly, he turns the captivity of Israel in the tribulation, verse 2, says he gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. Ezekiel 16, verse 55 says, Then thou and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. So he gathers Jews dispersed and scattered throughout the world under the reign of sin, and brings them back to Israel once again. <coughs> Bless you. Uh, point number three. He heals the brokenhearted, according to verse three. Doctrinally, that'll be Israel. Devotionally, any sinner who trusts in Jesus Christ. Amen. He heals the brokenhearted. Amen. Sometimes um, your heart is broken and God's able to mend it. You put it, put it back together. Sometimes you're... Your heart is broken over your own guilt, yep. over your own failings of, failings of Jesus Christ. Yep. 
The things that you should have done, you didn't do. Sometimes your heart is grieved and broken and you break down and cry because of the ways that God has blessed you and how un ungrateful you've been in light of it. Yeah. Many times a good cry can do you a world of good. Yeah. And uh, God will break your heart to put it back together again and make you into something more profitable for his sake. Point number four, another reason for praising God is he literally binds up the wounds of Jews who were injured in the tribulation, according to verse 3. Verse 3 says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He'll do that literally for the Jew or anyone persecuted under the man of sin. And spiritually, he's the good Samaritan, as he spoke about in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 10. The good Samaritan who uh, uh, paid someone to look after the man uh, lay weighed at the way laid at the side of the road and said whatever you spend more uh, put that on my bill I'll pay it next time I pass through point number five God actually knows how many stars there are in each galaxy verse four it's been you know God said uh, he would multiply the seed of Abraham as the stars uh, of the sky for multitude. And it has been estimated that for every grain of sand on every beach in the world, there is at least one star in the universe. It's hard to understand that, hard to reckon that. But God knows how many there are. Scientists only guess, and then every few years, eight, nine, ten years, they have to reestimate their, their uh, re, re evaluate their estimation and adjust their figures. Uh, but the sixth reason for which we can praise God, he not only knows how many there are, but he's named each one. <laughs> that's, that's marvelous. He's named each one. I don't know how many of them are named Joe. <laughs> But if there's a planet or a star named Joe, then uh, that's because of God. You have to see these organizations that say, give your loved one a beautiful gift of naming a star after them for Valentine's Day. Who would want that? Who in the world, what woman would think that's tender and romantic? I named a star after you, honey. It's called Old Hag, number 12. It's in the... <laughs> I don't think she would be too complimented by that. But God has named them all. If, if God could give to man and the brain of Adam the ability to name each animal that came before him, like a supercomputer, and then we assume that Adam remembered each name he gave each creature, then the God who made Adam would have no trouble naming every light in the night sky. Point number seven, or reason number seven, God lifts up the meek, verse six. Literally, when the kingdom comes, and spiritually, when a man humbles himself under the mighty hand of God, First Peter, as First Peter 5, verse six tells us to do, and God shall exalt you in due time, the Bible says. Proverbs 15, 33 states, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. Too many people, not many people want to be humble anymore. They want to humble somebody else because in so doing they think they're elevating themselves. Yep. How many people are like that in the world? Too many. And once you know somebody like that, you really don't want to be around them any longer. When someone can only run other people down to make themselves appear better, uh, they reveal a lot about themselves. They reveal how shallow they truly are, how insecure they truly are, how immature they truly are. By the way, when my wife and I were married for a while, I said to her, do I seem older to you? I mean, you see me day by day. Do I seem older to you? And she said, you're no more mature now than you were when we first met. Oh, no. <laughs> True. Hallelujah. 
<laughs> Think about that for a minute. But reason number eight, God literally casts the wicked to the ground at the advent. Verse six says, the Lord lifteth up the meat, he casteth the wicked down to the ground. That will literally happen at the advent of Christ. He will Amen. cast all the wicked into the lake of fire at the end of the millennium, according to Revelation chapter 20, verses 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, along in there. Reason number nine, he covers the heaven with clouds, according to verse eight. Psalm 18, verse 11 said, he maketh, excuse me, he made darkness his secret pit place, his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. On average, about 52% of the earth is under cloud cover at any moment. And uh, the uh, function of clouds is to, at least according to the people who estimate this or evaluate this, the function of clouds is to deflect heat and radiation coming from outer space from the sun. It deflects it back into the uh, atmosphere and uh, they say a cloudy night tends to be warmer than a, a night without clouds because the clouds also act as an insulation to keep heat underneath it close to the earth and keep it from escaping as quickly. And God has uh, likened his habitation to clouds in the sky uh, which will open and reveal his glory at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's even a cloud appreciation society you can belong to and uh, Every day they'll send you a new photograph of a particular cloud formation one of their members has taken and uploaded and uh, Everyone and if you're lucky you can have your photograph named cloud of the month <laughs> They actually have a, a, a recognition of a photography of photographs of clouds and then reason 11, or excuse me, reason 10, rain comes from God, verse 8. Run back, if you will, to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. And notice there, verses 33 and 34. Psalm 107, verses 33 and 34. He turneth rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. Rain, and we all know the, the benefits of rain, rainfall on crops, and to uh, stimulate vegetation growth and tree growth, flowers and grass, and those kinds of things. And uh, produce, you know, a flash flood will produce a running stream in the middle of an African desert, and only for a short time when that water is running through, the animals can come and then get a drink. Otherwise, that thing's just as dry and crusty the rest of the year, and um, uh, animals have to wander, searching for water to drink. God sends it to them, and God, uh, rain comes from God, but uh, also drought can be sent from God. Now those two verses we just read match what he says in Zechariah 14, verse 17. And you need to turn, let me run over there for you. Zechariah 14, and verse 17. It shall come to pass that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So God warns that those who will not come and worship Jesus Christ, seated upon his throne in the millennium, they'll go back home and have nothing but drought. And uh, it doesn't matter how modernized your cities are, you still need rain. You still need rain to keep the soil dry um, and to refill certain reservoirs, etc. And then reason 11 for praising God is he makes grass to grow. Verse 8 uh, and every other form of vegetation to flourish. Verse 8 says, Who covereth the heaven with clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. 
Go back, if you will, to Psalm 104. Psalm 104, and begin, if you will, at verse 14. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he hath planted, where the birds make their nests, as for the stork, the fir trees are her house, and so forth. But God causes it to rain, he makes grass to grow, he causes flowers to uh, bloom, uh, then he allows the bees to come and get uh, nectar uh, and pollen out of the flowers, and to, or pollinate other plants, and uh, they were threatening the last couple of years that there's a shortage of, of bees in the world and that there might, this may affect the uh, product, uh, production, the fruitfulness of crops worldwide. And, um, but uh, I, think, I think they've had to revise that. I think they've found hives and multitudes of bees in the most unlikely places. Um, but uh, nevertheless, they do the job, much of the job of pollinating the world. You know, after the flood, God began to uh, cause trees to grow once again. Birds uh, find seeds. Uh, trees and wherever else they feed. Uh, and they fly from one place to another. And many times those seeds fall out of their mouths or fall out of their beaks. And wherever those seeds fall, uh, new tree life is then begun. And God used the, cre the creation of his, his animals to do a lot of the replanting and reforesting of the world. And so God's creation is designed in such a way that it keeps sustaining itself. It keeps replenishing the world. Uh, without the help of man. And uh, there have been a multitude now, a ho rather, the host and hosts of animals once thought extinct that have been rediscovered and it turns out they weren't extinct after all. There are, more, there, there are a number of species still being discovered in jungles, uh, say in Indonesia, and some of those uh, multitude of islands there that make up that country, and uh, the depths of the oceans, they're finding new sea life and ocean life they never knew existed before. And uh, man thinks he's so bright and brilliant, he's discovered everything, he knows everything, and along comes some carcass of something they can't explain, it washes up on the beach, and uh, it looks just like a plesiosaur or some dinosaur that they thought had been long extinct, and there it is. It's funny how that dinosaur lived 65 million years. He wasn't that old, but he was just well hidden. And a coelacanth, the coelacanth fish, was thought to have gone, was declared extinct back in 1920. And nobody had seen it. And then in the, I think the 1980s, a uh, fisherman caught another one off the coast of Australia, and they've been regularly found and caught uh, since that time. And they say it's a fish that was here since the age of the dinosaurs and went extinct. And uh, they declared it to be extinct in 1920, uh, or along around there. And then not long later, someone found, a, found one, caught one. Turns out it wasn't extinct after all. Same thing with other species. Do you realize, do you know right now, now this is, um, it's, the details of this are still a bit, bit tenuous, but it seems to be more well established that there are pterodactyls, still living, still being seen in the sky in certain <laughs> places. You know, the, the image of the Thunderbird, common among American Indians, resembled the pterodactyl. How would they make images of something if they couldn't see it? They knew nothing about it. It may not have gone extinct 60 million years ago. It may just be very few in number or very well hidden, and who knows where they, where they reside at. 
but there have been some people who catch videos with their cell phones, and you can't, you never know how much to trust a video you see on the internet if it's just been created by computer trickery, but uh, I don't think all of it is. I don't think everybody has that kind of computer savvy to post a video of something they saw in the sky they don't know how to explain. But uh, point number 12, reason number 12, I should say, for praising God, he feeds untold billions of land animals and sea life every day. Verse 9 says, He giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. Uh, back at Psalm 145, verse 16 it says, Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. God does that day after day without man helping it out, helping it along. Amen. Only those animals that are kept in captivity by man does man have the responsibility of feeding. The ones out in the wild roaming on their own, they find food for themselves or they'll kill to feed themselves. It's amazing. I saw some, some idiot had a pet fox she was keeping at home, and uh, she was charged with animal cruelty because she's a vegetarian and decided to put her fox, her pet fox, on a vegetarian diet. And the thing was shrunken and emaciated and shriveled down on nothing but skin and bones nearly until the animal... Uh, uh, control authorities came along and said, that animal's a meat eater, and he needs to be allowed to eat the diet that he's, he's uh, used to eating, he's made to eat. Good for them. I hope she gets fined uh, severely for it. It doesn't mean you need a pet fox, it just means you need to understand God made nature to do certain things, and he didn't make you to be a vegetarian. Yeah. That's why you have canine molars. That's why you have teeth that are, have, are sharp incisors made for cutting and chewing on meat. And thank the Lord for meat, right? Amen. <laughs> but um, notice um, fowls are included, bird life, uh, fowls are included with the word beast there in verse 9. I want you to note the mention of ravens and horses right next to each other. Verses 9 and 10. He giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. But the mention of ravens and horses right next to each other, those things, those two creatures next to each other have prophetic implications which most of the modern Bible commentaries and commentators miss. Let me uh, illustrate that to you. Go back to the book of Job, chapter 39. Job 39. Job 39, and we'll begin there with verse 19. Job 39, beginning at verse 19. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him the glittering spear and the shield. He swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, Ha ha! And he smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. The horse says, Ha ha! That's the sound of a trumpet. <laughs> I didn't do it very well, but you know what I mean. Doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom? and stretch her wings toward the south? Doth the eagle mount up at thy command, and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock, and the strong place. From thence she seeketh the prey, and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up blood, 
and where the slain are, there is she. Go forward, if you will, to, to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. <coughs> Luke 17, and notice what Jesus says in verse 37. Luke 17, verse 37, <clears throat> they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. The eagles and the ravens, and the hawks too, are all considered unclean animals, according to Leviticus, and God's designation of clean and unclean animals. Run, if you will, to the book of Revelation, chapter 19. Revelation, chapter 19. And notice Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw a heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Jump down to verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And verse uh, 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. So I say the, the mention of the ravens and the horses right next to each other has some prophetic implication. The horse and the riders on the horses will provide the food for the eagles and the ravens and uh, flesh-eating animals to come and feast on after the battle of Armageddon. And when he says the horses and them that sat on them, he's not talking about the armies of heaven. He's talking about the armies of men uh, who will die at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you read Joel chapter 2, about verses 1 through 11, you'll learned that the believer is going to be part of a great army, a glorified army of saints, Revelation 19 describes, coming with Jesus Christ, an invincible, uh, indestructible army that plows through the wicked along with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, when they fall upon the sword, it shall not hurt them. And you and I will be incorruptible and... Um, without equal in the world. Invincible, it's amazing. Right now the whole society and pop culture is obsessed with superheroes, DC comics and Marvel comics, and, and some of that's sort of fun to watch if you want a diversion for a while, but the, the bigger point I'd make is you and I are going to be superheroes one day. Yeah. Amen. You'll think and you'll be wherever you want to be in the universe. No need for uh, transportation from NASA or any space agency. You won't need uh, an apparatus to breathe in outer space. You won't need some vehicle to transport you from here to there. You'll think you'll be there. And you'll walk through uh, solid objects as the glorified body of Jesus did and praise Him uh, with glorified form, in glorified form, as he possessed after his resurrection. And uh, it's hard for you and I to wrap our minds around that possibility. And I said this, I think, last week. Even if you're saved and you've never done anything for the cause of Christ, you've never witnessed to somebody, you've never passed out a track, you've been too timid to even talk about what God's done for you and why God loves people and sinners enough to die for their sakes, uh, let's suppose you've borne no fruit for Jesus Christ since the day you were born again. You're still going to get a new body at the rapture of the saints. That's a marvelous thing. And God would give that to you 
as undeserving as you are by that time. And the kindness of God bestowed upon us by and through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is beyond anything we could have ever hoped for. Amen. But um, verse 5 in our text, backing up just a little bit, great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. There he mentions the omnipotence, great power, and omniscience, his understanding is infinite. He mentions both of those qualities in the same verse. And that verse nearly summarizes this entire section we've just read. And the phrase, our Lord, there, is going to be the God of Jacob, most, more, most specifically. But the child of God can claim that for himself because of Jesus Christ. Go forward, if you will, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and we'll be finished for today. Ephesians 2, and let's start there with verse 11. Ephesians 2, verses 11 down through verse 17. Wherefore remember that ye, that's Gentiles, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, those are Jews, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That sure summarized the Gentile. Yeah. That sure summarizes the pagans, the heathen, yeah. barbaric Gentiles who had no knowledge of the God of Israel. That summarizes my ancestry very well and yours. Yeah. Verse 12, that at that, well, with verse, verse 12, uh, we already read verse 12, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were, were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby." If a Gentile says, I don't want anything to do with a Jew. I want nothing to do with Jewish people. I don't trust them. I don't want anything in common with them in any way, shape, or form. That man's not saved. Because the Bible says God had joined the Jew and the Gentile together by the blood of Jesus Christ. If a Jew says the Goyim, the Gentiles, are unclean, we want nothing to do with them. We remember the uh, Crusades of the Dark Ages and the Catholic Church in the name of Christianity, and that's pure Gentilism, if, you, if we ever saw it. We want nothing to do with the Gentiles. Obviously, that Jew is not saved. Verse 17, And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Through him, Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit unto the Father. It is only through the work, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that a man can approach God now. He had to approach God uh, before the time of Christ through the priesthood, the Levites at the temple. He would go there, he would bring the appropriate sacrifice for his sin, and he would confess his sin as that animal was being offered, and offered by the priest. He couldn't just go to the altar and put it on there himself. He had to uh, depend upon the priesthood to act as his mediator, to go between him and God, and do his work for him, and uh, obtain the grace, the forgiveness of God on that, man's, on that sinner's behalf, and then the sinner could walk away uh, free and clear and forgiven of that offense. But the next time he sinned and was uh, knew about it, he was obligated to do it again. Very difficult and very uh, tiresome practice. Who knows how many millions of animals were sacrificed during the centuries under the laws of Moses because of men's sins. At the hands 
of Levites who were sinners themselves. And so the sacrifice of the animals was not perfect. It was not uh, complete and sufficient to cleanse men of their sins once and for all. What a man needed was a perfect sacrifice that was greater in value than himself, so it wouldn't have to be repeated again, like the animals were. And there's where the Lord Jesus' death comes in on the cross of Calvary. Amen. He was equal to man, that he was born uh, as a man. He walked among men. He lived among men. He can identify with the, the weaknesses of the flesh of men and the temptations that come to men, yet without sin. Um, there's been the debate, and I heard, I turned the radio on the other day, so there's some Christian radio station where they field questions on the air, and these ministers were both just as, these two guys on the show, both as about as um, shallow in their Bible studies as they could be. One uh, said, uh, it's been debated whether that Christ could sin, uh, and I personally believe he was incapable of sin. Well then, well, then he can't really identify with you and I. If he was incapable of sinning at all, then it wasn't a fair test. He had to have at least the ability to sin, if he so chose, in order to identify with you and the temptations that you go through. Yet, he faced temptation without sin, without sinning. This is what makes him superior to you and me. This is what makes him victorious over sin and temptation and the temptations of Satan and the flesh and the devil. And by that success in resisting the temptations of Satan and coming out victorious on the other side without sin, uh, he is a perfect one to act as a substitute for you. Amen. He did what you were unable to do, and that was to resist sin in every shape and form that was presented to him. But, uh, so the Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice that the animals were not. And he represents a sacrifice that does not need to be repeated. It's sufficient one time for all. Amen. Roman, or rather, first Hebrews 10, verse 10, verse 12, verse 14. You want to look those up later. Uh, but this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 12.